Well, I'm going to talk about the Office of the Magazine's Privileged Venture, and the Bonclaw's son, Richard Yola, and the Kumbori Yana, and the Kassentori, and the San Kjartan, and the Vulvos, and the Glakok, and the Daravu, and the Kitchen, and the Kassentori Kjartan, and the Sivlin Idiot Nokahok. Dear friends, I'm delighted to be here today to launch uh, this important memorial commemorating all those human rights defenders who have lost their lives since the Universal Declaration on Human Rights Defenders was adopted, as you have heard, in 1998. Uh, Listening as I was to the beautiful words of Te Recuerdo, Amanda, may I say uh, that has been a a most poignant reminder of the life and heroic death of Victor Hara. Uh, I remember uh, when I visited during the winding up of the period of the <coughs> dictatorship of Pinochet um, uh, for the plebiscito when I was observator Uno and that for that process, meeting Joan Hara. I had launched her book, Victor, an unfinished song, many years earlier uh, here in Dublin. And I'm absolutely delighted that only very recently has she and her two daughters been vindicated in terms of those who are responsible for the, uh, the, the murder and cruel assassination of Victor. It, it, it's a great choice as a song for many, many reasons, because uh, Victor Hara in his life, uh, from the time he came as a young man, as it was described in that book, with his boots open to La Peña, to the Peña, Violeta Para, and sung songs for people in all the different events of their lives into Chile until his brutal uh, torture uh, and assassination. And I must say, uh, as we pass along and as I have been listening to these words, it is one of uh, the great moral affronts uh, to think uh, that the perpetrator of those actions, the author of them, would be received Uh, in European cities and accorded uh, honour and significance as if, in fact, la munidad, that he was immune from the consequences of these actions. But that is for another day. But I have to say to you that it is that that song uh, of Victor's, uh, which is, and all of his words, his beautiful one uh, that's in the middle of the mass for the peasant, which he sings, uh, is so important because the songs of Victor Hara have reached far beyond the boundaries of his native Chile and they've echoed down the years uh, and as people have recalled uh, the circumstances of his being put to death in 1973. And today he is correctly remembered around the world as a potent symbol of struggle uh, for human rights and justice. Before I move on as well, said that people have referred to the time I went first to Central America and soon I have to remember uh, I went there uh, and met in Mexico Marianela Garcia, uh, who later went back to Salvador and who was raped and murdered. And I met Marianela's mother, when grandmother, when I went back as president of Ireland uh, just a short while ago. And there in the memorial stone in uh, San, the San Salvador city, I think there is an attempt to reco- record the names of all those who lost their minds. I want to say one other thing as I listen to what has been said already that is very important. It is so important to call states to account and it is very important to call those who wield power to account. And, but uh, the most important figure I've heard percent of the activities of last year and the year before were those who were defending environmental rights. Uh, The most unaccountable section at the moment in the history of the planet is in fact international corporations who are operating outside of the law. And whether people are being poisoned in their water systems in Ecuador, I always remember, and we should never forget, the statement made by those who are professionals professional lawyers who say acting on behalf of the company responsible for pouring cyanide into the water system of the peasants of Ecuador. We will fight this case until hell freezes over and then we will fight it on the ice. So there is an issue only, not only of confronting the state. The most difficult target by a long mile is in fact irresponsible corporations 
who often work, in the case of uh, Colombia, for example, who work in association with terrorist groups, and also who have always somebody, uh, and the same breath as they condemn terrorism, they are actually working with instruments of terror um, to, in fact, particularly working against indigenous people indigenous rights and people working against, and nearly very, very much centred around uh, the immoral use of extractive industries. And these are issues that do indeed concern us all. I won't be distracted uh, anymore, but I just want to say what a great privilege it is to be here as President of Ireland and to pay tribute to, the, to, to, launch, this, to launch this memorial. Uh, we've seen there all did more than on that memorial so far, there are the names of more than three and a half thousand extraordinary brave people who are men, women and men who have died worldwide in the last 18 years in the defence of justice. And people, and so many people in this room in front of me know well that it isn't a matter just of the loss of life, it is a matter of the removal of dignity and torture and the imposition of extraordinary grief not just only on those who are involved, but on their families. Their names and their lives speak about how the demands of the pursuit of justice have a power that cannot be overcome by censure, torture and assassination. It is a power that lives on through all those who are inspired by example to take up the baton and continue the defence of human rights, the rights humanos, in <coughs> countries across the globe. I have to say, uh, as well in these discourses, uh, it's very important to see the people who, who are involved rather than to ever to see them lost uh, in statistics. I think, for example, about Chile, with which I would be familiar, and one is only to think, for example, of Foreign Minister Munoz's own book in relation to In the Shadow of the Dictator, and there's of the women, older women, many of them, who wander in the desert uh, trying to find, see where they pick the bones of their, their partners who have been dropped from the sky during the period of this, this dictatorship. The notion that the world can move on and therefore that you can see human rights, that you can see the defence of human rights as somehow as the soft underbelly of a world that can't be changed is of a great, great evasion. Uh, the, the fact is that you have to realise how power has been exercised uh, and how it has been exercised sometimes in a sinister uh, uh, and subtle way. As we were preparing in 2015 for the New York Conference on Sustainable Development or the Paris Conference on Climate Change, uh, the people who were most directly affected uh, were indigenous peoples. Yet it was very hard to find the space that had been given to them uh, uh, in the discourse because the assumption was you could leave corporate power intact while you went on and talked about human rights or ecological rights. Whatever. And this, of course, you cannot do. It's a, that would be a contradiction. I think as well the, what is very important, the wording of that which has been referred to, to already, uh, the Human Rights Defenders text in the, at the, given at the United Nations General Assembly, everyone has the right, individually and in association with others, to promote and to strive for the protection and realisation of human rights and fundamental freedoms at the national and international levels. That was the landmark declaration that acknowledged the importance of human rights defenders and their critical role in addressing the terrible consequences of the abuses of power. I think that one of the most interesting problems that has been in the modern period has been the great difficulty uh, of uh, putting the vindication of uh, economic, social and cultural rights into the same strong space uh, as political rights. It was rather, I think, and as I look back at my age on it, as if people should have been satisfied with the illusion that if they were consulted every few years, uh, that somehow or another their world, world would automatically come right. Uh, the reality of it is, is that at the base of the human rights movement in its better moments across different countries is the concept of dignity. And I think that that is crucially related, therefore, to the rights of people to protect their environment, uh, to protect their aspirations for development in accordance with their own cultures. 
uh, rather than to be the dependent variables of an endless, insatiable, unaccountable, unrepresentative and undemocratic corporate greed. I'm not saying for a second uh, that therefore that this is some kind of condemnation of all corporations. No, it is not. It's just simply in the same way as persons and governments have to be called into account and should be exposed for abuse. So also should those corporations who are not operating in accordance with ideological responsibility, with democratic and countable systems, and who are abusing cultural and indigenous rights, so must they be called to, to account. And if they are called to account, does this mean that they can in fact actually be, be committing atrocities in one part of the morning and be having lunch with the most powerful in the world in the afternoon? Uh, these are contradictions uh, that have to be faced up to, and as a head of state, I feel it is my duty to call to attention to, these, to this contradiction. Uh, human rights defence is not a pastime. Human rights defence is a core affirmation of the importance of dignity and humanity for every person in the planet, in every circumstances, and in the different circumstances. This raises the question, then, about the people that we will see and that will be part of the memorial, what they have in common. What they have in common is uh, uh, something that is there in literature, uh, across all the literatures of the world, uh, where someone says, I had to speak out. It's in Mrs. Poe is a member in that, in that one, where people who have confronted landlords, where the tenant was to remain silent so that they might get a different acre and so forth and be let survive. And the wife who is starving bursts out, you are wrong, you, you cannot do this to us. And then she says, now I have done it, I have spoken out. But all of these people who are people who have broken silent, they have broken silent in relation to not accepting the enforcement of the views of the status quo as defined by oppressors. And in doing so, yes, they challenge and inspire us all, <clears throat> but they also leave us with an obligation uh, to join with them. I think that... They should dislodge those who are indifferent, or those whom I spoke a very long time ago, those who were able to avert their gaze. Because I remember when I was with Sally O'Neill on the rubbish dumps in El Salvador during the worst of the times, and the question arose in my own mind, I've often spoken about it, how could your life ever be the same again? And therefore you could do something, you could try and drop it out of your consciousness and not remember. How could you do that? And yet people do that. Life goes on and indifferent. We cannot afford to be indifferent. The launch of this memorial will dislodge indifference and it will refocus, I hope, the gaze of those who might have averted it from the structures that are supporting the regular threats to the lives of people. I think that, therefore, as well, human rights defenders are active in every part of the world. I think that that is very important and they, 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 they deserve the support of institutions, governments and citizens uh, in supporting those who are facing harassment, intimidation, stigmatisation, violence and persecution. The greatest instrument the oppressor has, the greatest instruments tyrant have, is when in fact they have closed off the gaze of the outside world on what is happening. I remember very well in a prison in Turkey, the defender of, uh, of, uh, of the people who had been abused their lawyer being beaten up in front of them and then dragged in front of them and they being told, look at your lawyer now. The breaking away, the breaking of the, con the connection with all of the atrocities of what's happening is one that we must defend and frontline defenders um, is incredibly important uh, as an organisation. So today I want to commend them for undertaking this initiative in establishing a memorial, documenting the cases giving the people, in a sense, their life back in the minds and consciousness of those who are coming after. Because each and every one of the people who you will see were people who were selfless and fearless. And I think that the memorial supported as it is by very many national and international organisations can be a platform and can be a space of consciousness for those who will continue the work. I think today we're acknowledging our obligation to ensure that victims are honoured and never regarded as merely the people that are making up the statistics. We send a message of solidarity to the families, 
the friends and colleagues of human rights defenders have been killed, and we assure them that the work and great courage of their loved ones has not gone unnoticed. It is my privilege and grief today to have met Rafael Maldonado Calas of Guatemala, whose colleague Jeremy Barrios Lima was killed at 20, 20 dos años, at 22 years of age, shot dead over a week ago, and I express my sympathies, President of Ireland, to Rafael on that loss, but like in Irlanda. And I also, this database that is here will also serve an important purpose in allowing the tracking of investigations into the unlawful killing of human rights. As I've said just a couple of months ago, the final tale of who was responsible, for example, for the torture of Victor Hara has just been exposed in Florida. And for, Victor, for Joan and her two daughters, this was very, very important. I think that the database will serve also as a very important tool in advocacy and in campaigning in the area, the area of human rights, the Regis Humanos. So we might, I think that the memorial will record in words and images the courage of the people who pursued what I have said was that fundamental dignity and freedom of their fellow human beings. I often think of that as I come to the end to say this, about how even las palabras, the words, can be stolen from you. When I was a young person, the word freedom was an invitation to be part of all of these struggles all over the world. And it was in my own time, as I come to these stages of my life, that I see the word freedom debased to be called the freedom of the market, that must in fact actually invade every aspect of human life, that mustn't be impeded, that must be allowed to serve insatiable grief, and it's going to force a homogeneity on the world in which people are just kind of some consequential trash that are associated with the accumulation of ever more capital. This is, a, 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 this is in itself, uh, uh, I think, what we have to do. And what we do in song is what Victor Chai did in a way that was more popular than his colleague and uh, his fellow citizen Pablo Neruda, is to claim back words for meaning. Freedom to be free from hunger, free to be free from the effects of climate change, to be free from oppression, to be free from being abused because of your gender, sexual orientation, or any aspect of your life as a human being. That is freedom. And I think, therefore, we must, I hope, the memorial, as people gaze and look at the lives and images of the people on it, people will be encouraged to came back the words as well. For, uh, for all of us. I want to finish then by saying this. Even as we speak, more names are being added. Gross violations of human rights continue throughout the world. The tragedy of the suffering of the people of Syria, Iraq and Yemen cannot be far from our thoughts this evening. And it is very evening as those people, for example, who with their machines and so forth, buy those, buy the fuel, the fossil fuels, that in fact will enable them to keep moving and to keep ignoring and to keep forgetting and keep evading, should know also that in Yemen, people are being slaughtered by some of the more unaccountable forces uh, on this world. The number of human rights defenders is rising, unfortunately, 196 people. But they are a glorious group of people, and it is up to us to ensure that, in fact, that none of them will ever struggle or die in vain. I think Ireland has very, very hard for the establishment of the United Nations Human Rights Council, and when it was elected to the Council in 2012, that was a recognition of the importance it attached to both the Human Rights Council and, very importantly, to the Universal Periodic Review. But these reports that come in the University of Puerto are very, very important. Next year we'll see an international campaign on the theme of Stop the Killings. And I would like to welcome all those who have travelled here from around the world to take part in this week's meeting to discuss the strategy for this campaign. And I will make appeal to the international media, however difficult it is, while they tell us the successes of those who rightly should be celebrated, congratulated for their success in different aspects of human experience, <coughs> tell us about all the killings and tell us as much as you can of all the stories behind the killings and expose the structures that create the killings. And then your work, I think, will be even more important. 
Your work this week, those of you here, is very important in our continuing struggle to create safe and enabling environments for those who do break silence against injustice and oppression. And I want to take the opportunity of wishing a most fruitful and successful meeting. Gwims gokra kaspanach ta gokra ta megar shulaki stosna lehante tolichia. Gwims wert and todas kosas. And as I finish my speech, I do want to pay tribute to a dear colleague for over years, and that is frontline defenders Mary Lawler, who can't be with us, who for over 15 years has been a passionate advocate for human rights defenders. And as she hands on the baton now, may I take this opportunity of expressing my deepest admiration to her for her commitment and unceasing effort to advance the cause of human rights. So... Marfakas Gris Minla Marish Mavuikas Sagoa Lever Fat, a ton shown you with Oik Abar Gudin, Ersan Kas Mint on the Krinya, Agasatoi Nilianta Tossex, a Tredinag Egora, Malam Shivkama, as a Kintanok Tianta Darmat River Namanas Nafir Krogishin, a Kaila Kagasikint, Gamegor Gwithen or an Inspiroid do shoot, Garminlum Dan is Fergus Nis Karma Crow. In conclusion, may I thank all of you here today who do so much to defend all of those at the front line of the struggle against injustice. I also commend you for ensuring that the bravery of those women, children and men will continue to live on as inspiring examples to all those who wish to create a better and a fairer world with the stamp of humanity on it. Muchas gracias. Thank you.